Hello and welcome to Tech Bike Parts. As promised, we're going to uh, show you the development of some parts to make the bike go better and give a bit more power. Um, this is at the very beginning of the development and it may take a few twists and turns on the way and you're going to be with us on the journey. Um, we haven't actually fitted any of the parts of the bike yet and after looking at the motor and going back into our own ancient history, uh, we've got a history of BSA singles, uh, CCM singles, Husqvarna singles, SR400, XT500, uh, all of a similar sort of ilk of two valve motors. Now most of the Japanese motors, although they look like this, are actually much shorter stroke. They're a much more square bore to stroke ratio than these, so therefore they rev better. Now this has got a very long stroke for what it is for a 410 motor. And when we looked at it, we thought, yeah, it's definitely been designed to bore up. But the problem is with boring this up, there's no cheap solution to doing it. And the, the options on the market at the moment are, give very little increase in bore size for the money involved. So we delved into the motor to have a good look to see what was going on. So I've, I've got a cylinder head off, off the motor here. Now, as you can see, there's very little room to get any larger valves in without off offsetting them, which again turns expensive and it's not so easily done on, a, on an overhead cam motor. But the valve seat angles and um, shape of the ports, they do, there is room for improvement there, don't get me wrong. And we are going to eventually port this head and put it on the floor bench and see how we can improve it, because I think there is room to get. You know, maybe it's a one or two horsepower extra there, just by cleaning up the, the way the factories make things. Um, particularly around the area of the valve seats and just underneath the inlet valve. That's the most important area of porting on a motor, and that's where you can get your, your biggest gains. People go on about matching ports and that. It, matching ports doesn't give you the, the advantage. It's good practice to do it. You don't want to step because it causes turbulence and we will probably will match the ports as well but that's not where you get your best advantages in, on porting ahead but we're not going to do that at first what we're going to do is change the camshaft now cam change on one of these is actually very simple and straightforward you don't need any special tools um, in fact, I don't even think you need, you, you might need a gasket for, for the, the cam chain adjuster. I think that's about the only gasket you're going to need. Because what you need to do, basically you need to take the tank and seat off and take the top cylinder head cover off here. And then the cam, which runs in this bearing here, and you literally just remove the chain and sprocket and lift the cam out and put the new one in. Now, this little cover at the end here, the Royal Enfield say not to remove it with the, this clamp down. But I've actually cheated a bit and I've managed to prise it out. And I'm going to show it because I wanted to see where the, the timing marks were on the motor. Um, and I'll show you in relation to the timing marks on the flywheel, uh, how you set it up uh, to time the cam and get it at top dead centre. Now, it's important that you have all these reference points before you start, so you can time the cam up correctly when you put it back together. It's not complicated, it's really simple, and the beauty of this engine over a lot of modern engines is you don't have to take any of the side casings off, you don't have to disturb any gaskets, you have a little port in the, the, the left side cover that allows you to get to the end of the crankshaft so you can turn it, with just taking a couple of screws off. That's sealed with an O-ring, so you don't need a gasket on that. And there's a, a little inspection port at the front onto the alternator flywheel, which gives you your timing marks. Now there's a few marks on there, so you've got to get the right one. And I always like to identify it with a dot of white paint, just so you don't get mixed up when you're putting it back together again. But I'll show you that as we strip it, uh, and it'll give you a better idea. But it really is a fairly straightforward job to do. And I can't imagine it's going to take much more than an hour or so. So, um... More on the cam. Now we've worked carefully with our cam maker because we make a lot of cams for Triumphs and we found with Euro 4 bikes that the cams are very lacking because 
because of the fact of the emission control. Um, now you can gain a lot just by giving the cam a little bit more overlap. Um, and on this brand new cam that we have here, we've given it more overlap, lift and duration. We've made three and this is our best guess of being the best one from basically from our experience. So we're going to put this one in first, we're going to dyno it up uh, and we should see from what the bike does on the dyno without any other changes from the previous dyno run where we're gaining, where we're losing. Now hopefully we won't lose too much of the bottom end torque because we haven't gone too radical with this cam. Uh, we have designed it so it will breathe better uh, and give us better overlap to get a cleaner combustion. Um, fingers crossed this is this is going to be the one. Um, like I say, we'll, if we're heading in the right direction with this we may not get a huge jump in, in performance but we'll see where the bike's breathing better and we can improve the breathing by then changing the, the induction and exhaust system because just changing those at the moment doesn't seem to give a vast amount of improvement on these engines and this is what we found with Triumphs that you couldn't get the gains that you would expect with changes to the induction, fuel injection and exhaust because the cam was the limiting factor it wouldn't let the engine draw in the air and fuel mixture that it needed um, to benefit from the, the freer flowing nature of a, a decatted pipe and a, a free flowing exhaust and a, and a, a high flow uh, intake. So once we've got the cam in and we've seen where, which direction we're going with it, we then will do these further improvements and take it the natural project progression one step at a time. That's the important thing with tuning. You only do one thing at a time when you're developing. Because if you do two things and you don't get the expected result, you don't know which has either taken you forwards or backwards. So it is a slow laborious process, I know. Um, and you need to do a back-to-back -back dyno test every time. Um, because you cannot tell by seat of the punts if it's worked or not. Because optimism is a funny thing. And a lot of the time when you're going slow, you actually think you're going faster. Particularly with exhaust systems, because they're louder. You think you're going faster and you're actually going slower. So, we'll crack on. We'll start getting the tools out now. And we'll, we'll, we'll start stripping the cylinder head down. Hello and welcome to the future. Um, we put the cam in, which we're showing you in the video, and it worked quite well. Uh, we knew we were almost there. But we were using reground stock cams for development. And you're a bit limited in what you can do there. Um, you can normally only take a, a boat about half a millimetre off the base circle, uh, and then you just run out a tap at adjustment. We actually did take a little bit more off it during development. We had to use specially modified um, rocker arm adjusters. Um, but we found that we just couldn't get the time and duration that we we're looking for. So we opted for this, which is a, a one-piece steel billet cam. Um, we did do a couple of versions of the other development cam, and then we have did a couple of um, versions of this production cam. I'll show you a wilder one. We did go for what is almost a race cam, um, not just a, a, a fast road high performance cam. Um, this worked really well at top revs, but it, it lost too much at the bottom end, which is what we're expecting. But you've got to go that far in development to see where you, you, you're getting past the sweet spot sort of thing. So we call this the Goldilocks cam. It's, you know, it's just right. It gives you enhanced bottom end, Great mid-range, um, and it also gives the, the more important thing, it lets the bike breathe the top end. The thing that we identified that was the, the problem with the Himalaya uh, 410 motor. So, we've junked the, the exhaust valve lifter because of the, the, the time and, and the duration we've got on this. We learned from Triumph Motors when we do this, you don't actually need the exhaust valve lifter anymore. But we needed to test it properly. We need to test it in several bikes, so we'll put it in five different Himalayas owned by a couple of Royal Enfield dealers and some friends of ours and ourselves. We ran them all. I was out all over the winter in freezing cold weathers. Not very pleasant, but not much else to do during lockdown. Um, and obviously the, this past year has been a bit difficult. The other thing 
the, the sort of dilemma it threw at us was the, the announcement of the Euro 5 models. We had thought, like a lot of the trade did, that Euro 5 might be postponed again because of COVID. Um, but the Euro, uh, EU have none of it. They said that it had to go ahead on schedule. So uh, we were hoping to get hold of Euro 5 bikes early. Um, we were promised one early, one of the first ones in the country. We did get one of the first bikes in the country, but we didn't get it until about three months later than was expected due to factory shutdowns and shipping delays. More likely, it was mostly shipping delays and, and things like a ship getting stuck in the Suez Canal didn't help at all for, for port delivery. But we, we've, we've got it now got a Euro 5, had it running for a few thousand miles. We did have to do one or two tweaks so it works well in both the Euro 4 and the Euro 5. Um, but what we've found now is that we've got a cam that you don't need to do any other modifications to at all. You simply drop this into the bike, um, let the, auto, the ECU auto adjust and ride it away. You don't need to change air filters, air filter plates, exhaust systems, anything. This is the ultimate drop and go modification. The cam that we supply it's also supplied with a little pin. Um, it's supplied without it in and you'll need to press it in. Um, but that's an easy thing to do. Again, I'll, I'll mention more about that later on. Um, but they've been tested for thousands and thousands of miles collectively over the bikes. In summer weather, cold weather. Uh, we've got run run in the States in California in quite hot weather conditions. Uh, the feedback from everybody's been great. Um, on my own personal one, I've gone up a tooth on the sprocket. We've done extensive motorway testing where we basically get up to motorway speeds, drive with everything on the motorway. It had indicated sort of 75, 80 mile an hour, and we'll just hold it there for a couple of hundred miles until the tank goes, runs dry. No problems whatsoever, the motor running hot or anything like that. Really good, and it runs much better miles per gallon with the extra tooth on the, on the sprocket too. Um, so, like I say, with benefit of uh, future hindsight, <laughs> um, we'll now go back to June 2020 um, and everything that we, we didn't know then that we know now. Um, but these will be available now. Like I say, they will fit all the models, including the Euro 5 model now. Um, and I'd just thank, like to thank you for your patience. I know a lot of people have been waiting for this coming out. And the dyno runs have, have, have actually proved that it's been worth the wait. Uh, we were getting, uh, basically what uh, Royal Enfield said, 24 horsepower with a totally stock run-in bike. It's had about a thousand mile on it, I think. Um, then we did a back-to-back -back run with just putting the cam in, nothing else, no air filters, exhaust or anything. Uh, and it went up from 24.6 with 24.5 pounds foot to 28.4 horsepower and 27.1. Um, we then put a uh, just a can on, a, a high flow can. Uh, it actually produced more power with the baffle in than with it out, strangely enough. Uh, and um, a DNA air filter. That's all we did. We left the stuck, everything else stuck on the bike. Again, stock ECU, uh, and that produced 29.4 horsepower and 28.9 foot pounds of torque. But the torque curve and the power curve are also very interesting because you can see that the um, the power drops away quite drastically on the the stock motor as the revs go up. And you'll know that yourself if you've got a stock bike. It, revving it doesn't seem to do you much good at all. Whereas the, the, there's quite a big jump um, with the cam in. Um, so it means it will pull a higher top speed. And also it, it'll pull that extra gear like I say. But you do get good improvements when you put uh, things like a, a silence or air filter on. Uh, whereas before you didn't seem to get much improvement at all and I have seen dyno runs where when you put a straight, th uh, straight through sensor on the power ac actually drops quite a bit uh, which was our experience with the bike as well so um, like I say we, we did a lot of testing we went past the point of, of being perfect and came back to where we wanted to be with it and I'll now put you back a year back in time to show you me stripping the bike for the very first time one mistake I've, I've actually noticed in watching the video is um, 
it, it doesn't tell you this actually in the, uh, the the factory workshop manual but when you fit the sprocket in I actually put the, the tab washer this way around on the sprocket what you should re really do is put it that way around covering the pin I mean these pins are really tight but just in case it came out um, the, the, the tab washer would stop it it's just good engineering really but it, w it wouldn't matter because these are they take a lot of driving out they're actually pressed in so it was just a, something I picked up on on myself on the video but continue watching um, go through we'll put all the, the technical details on the website uh, and the dyno runs and if you've got any questions email me about it but these will be up on the website now as well for sale at a very very keen price hi a quick change of scene Anyway, what we need to do first is remove the tank, remove the seat. Uh, to remove the tank, you just need to unclip the fuel line, unplug the wire into the fuel pump, the fuel gauge, and take the vent pipe off. One quick note: um, there is a full Royal Enfield Workshop manual available for this bike, free of charge. A few nice people in India have put it up on the, the, the internet. Um, and it's free there for everybody to use. I don't think Royal Enfield sanctioned it, by the way, and some of the posts have been taken down. But I will put a link up to it uh, now, and you can read through it, and you'll have all your things like torque settings and uh, valve clearances and all that there, written out in black and white for you to see. It also gives you the procedure. Now, in true workshop manual style, it is a bit disjointed the way it does it, because it shows you a full engine strip down, and then a full engine rebuild. So you've just got to pick the bit out of the strip down and the bit out of the rebuild that ascertain to what you're actually doing. And it's a very small part at the beginning of the strip down and a very little bit at the end of the strip down that you're looking at. All of the, the strip in the engine gearbox and clutch doesn't concern you. Um, the only thing you're going to need is some special Loctite um, silicon gasket. Now, you could probably use any silicon gasket, but Royal Enfield specify this, this special type of Loctite and I'll show you as when we come to put that on you know how to apply it and where it goes. So to get the fuel pipe off if you look it's got like a squared section with a little square inside each side you need to squeeze both of those together and pull twist and pull but pull it off straight now never do it with a hot engine and always make sure you've got a, a piece of cloth or paper handy because you will get a dribble of fuel out of the fuel line and the last thing you want on a hot day is this running onto a hot exhaust because that might just end the job rather quickly so we need to disconnect the wiring and we need to undo these two bolts here so it's always good practice when you're doing any work like this on the bike just to disconnect the negative terminal off your battery, just in case. So your fuel sender wire is on the left hand side underneath here, just a little two pin connector you squeeze to take it off. And if you lift your tank up, you can get the vent overfill pipe at the top on the inside. You can take it off at the back as well if you want. Typical, this tank is absolutely full of fuel. So put your tank away somewhere safe. So we've got this cover off here. We've got this plug out of here. We've got this cover off here. Now I've been a bit naughty and removed this plug from here just to show you where the timing marks are, but you're not supposed to take that off. I've removed the plug and I've removed the rocker covers. Now what we need to do I've actually got it in the top dead centre mark there, but I'll show you how to make sure that you're at top dead centre. Turn the engine until you see the inlet valve open, and that's it, and then it's just closed again. And then keep continuing up until it comes up to top dead centre on the compression stroke. Now that, on the timing, on the camshaft, is marked when those two lines there exactly in line with the face of the surface on the cylinder head. Now to help you make sure you're not 180 degrees out, 
they've also put this little line on here so you you know that that line has to be upwards now what you need to do is you can't see very well is shine a light in here and you'll come up to the T mark which is top dead centre Now always turn the, the motor anti-clockwise up to the mark and there's a few marks here so make sure you get the right one now in the manual it actually says this is marked with an X but on this motor it's marked with a T and that's definitely right because we are at alignment on the cam mark in there I'll just confirm it with the plug hole to make sure it's a top dead centre, but I'm pretty sure it will be. Right, so what we need to do now is take these bolts off here. Now, one thing I've never mentioned when we started is you're going to need to put the motor back to the, the cam back together. A good quality torque wrench that goes down to 10 um, newton metres or, or below. Fairly low rated. Just to get these, I haven't checked what the, the torque ratings are, but this is what I always use for putting cam carriers in. Because this is a bearing surface here. And if you start tightening this down unevenly, you'll cause this to be distorted. So it must be tightened down in the correct sequence. A little bit at a time, keep talking it down, and then finally tighten it to the correct torque values. And the same applies when you take it off. You don't just go winding one bolt out and then move to the next one. You crack each one off, maybe a quarter or half a turn each, go all the way around, diametric, diametrically opposite to each other, side to side, back to front. Loosen them all. You may want to get a piece of cord with some holes in to put the bolts in because they're all slightly different to the bolts. So just to make sure you put them back in the correct holes. And when you put it back on again, make sure it's tightened down evenly and torqued. Because if you distort this, you could cause a, a, a barren failure. Because the, the, the cam runs directly in the head. Um, and that would be quite disastrous. So it, it's very important that you do torque it down to the correct settings. So to gain better access in here, th this looks like it's in the way of this, this um, air injection system. So I've just pulled the pipes off there. I've unplugged it from the multi-plug on this side and I'm going to remove the, the mountain bracket and its two bolts from the frame on the right hand side. Now don't forget there's, a, there's actually a main earth that goes onto those brackets as well so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the bracket off and I'm going to put the bolts back in the holes so I'm going to take the little unit off but I'm going to put the bolts back in the holes with the earth wires on just so I don't forget to reconnect the earth wires when I put it back together. Another important thing of note is not all these bolts have washers on so be careful to note which bolts have washers and which don't. Like these ones have and these ones don't and these ones have so it's very important to make a note of that now you'd think all your bolts are off there but you'd be wrong you've got two M8 headed ones which are tucked away inside the valve covers here one there and one there so just don't forget those and try to force it off because it won't come off until you get those off now another thing I like to do before I take the, the cover off is just loosen the, the, the tap that just as off because it's much easier to do it now than later and just back them off a touch because you're going to need to adjust those when you put it back together again anyway. Now there's a couple of prying points front and rear. Now this gasket cement does tend to get a good overhaul so you just don't wag it, just give it a good steady push and you'll feel it just pull away. And you've got a, a prying point on this side as well. Don't pry under the fins because you're probably going to snap them off. And just don't force anything, just let it come gently. Now you'll find it's held on dowels like all machined parts like this are for accuracy. They'll not just be held on the bolts and you'll find it'll stick on the dowels a bit. 
and just be very careful that you don't drop a dowel. No, I've got a feeling. I know I've got. A, I thought I might have had to have removed the coil. Now I might remove the ignition coil anyway to, for access going back in again. But there you go. There's your your top cover off. I so said just make sure that you don't lose any of these dowels that they're fully pushed home see one stayed in the head there and one's come out in the cover but uh, just be careful of those that they don't drop down in the engine now this is all going to need a good um, clean off with silicon gasket remover it's this surface has to be perfect um, to put it all back together again and you can see your, your bearing points here there's a little bit of marking actually on that surface. Uh, sorry, no, that's where the plug goes in, so that's okay. This is the actual bit that it runs on here. And these here are roller rockers here. So it's fairly simple once you get it off. It looks quite daunting, but it's, uh, it's not rocket science. Okay, so I've got all the gasket cleaned off there. Now, you can use a, a gasket removing liquid and a plastic scraper. I never use a metal scraper on a gasket like this because it, it is a mating surface so you, you don't want any damage or marks on it. Luckily they use a silicon based gasket um, sealer and silicon based gasket sealers uh, are softened by petrol so if you get petrol on a cloth and just go around a few times and wet it you can then just scrape it off with a plastic scraper or with your fingernail either and then give it a good good rub with just a soft cloth and that'll get all the, the last little bits off there. Now as you can see there's a T mark on the sprocket here and you've also got your two alignment marks here on the sprocket that, that made up with the cylinder head. So again this confirms that everything's in the, the correct time and mark uh, point here. So what we need to do now is, is knock this tab back Turn the engine one complete turn until the other uh, bolt comes up. Knock that tab back and take the bolt out. And then bring it back to the time and mark and take this one out. So that's the lower one fully removed. And we return it back up again anti clockwise. So we're back up to the time and mark again. The top dead centre. I've already loosened this one before I took it around. And it's very important that these are torqued correctly when you put them back in. Use Loctite on them and the lock and tab washer. You really need to make sure that they don't come loose in use because uh, it could have catastrophic consequences for the engine if either of those bolts came out. Right, all we need to do now is remove the, the time and chain tensioner with these two allen headed bolts. Pull it out and slacken the chain you can then pull the sprocket off the um, camshaft and pull the camshaft out the right hand side. So you'll need to get the, the little half round thrust shim out of there. You can normally just poke it out with the screwdriver or get it out with a pair of tweezers or something. Now you probably have to tap the sprocket off because it's normally quite a tight fit on the sprocket and then just prise it off. Now you need to get something just to hook the chain onto so it doesn't drop on the bottom. I'm just going to put the hammer shaft in there to, to keep a hold of that. What you want to carefully do let it drop down is don't let it bunch up on the sprocket on the bottom because it can cause it to miss a tooth and then you'll find that your chain's short to get on. Right, so got the new cam in. Basically we put the T and the line to the top and then you'll see the holes all line up there. Again we've got to drop that off just so we can get it on. I'm going to sort of drop that into place over the edge there. Right, this is where we need to 
check to see if it one tooth out or not. Yeah, that looks pretty good. I'm not looking at the timing mark here. I'm only looking at these two marks and the T mark and the bottom mark in here to make sure everything lines up. It's top dead centre. Pop one of the bolts. I'm not using Loctite at this stage on this bolt. Just getting it in there to get it in position. Now make sure you screw it in a fair way so it doesn't catch the cylinder head. And make sure you put your thrust shim in as well. Make sure it's located in the right position. Right, so turn in time again. Again, always turn in the same direction. You see why I screwed that in quite a bit because it's very close to the cylinder head. Right, now with this bolt, we're actually going to clean it and put some Loctite on. So I've got a little drop of uh, Loctite on that bolt there, just so it's belt and braces. So the tightening torque on this bolt is between 10 and 12 newton meters. So we've gone exactly halfway, 11 newton meters. Now I'll just tap that tab washer up into place there. Turn it round until we get the other one in line. So I've locked tightened both the bolts, torqued them both up to 11 newton meters, flattened the tab washers off, and I'm just going to bring it back up to the timing mark. And everything's correct. I should look in that hole and see the T mark now lined up exactly, which it is absolutely spot on. So what we need to do now is just give that one final wipe over. Put our gasket cement on and put the rocker cover on but what I'm going to do before that I'm actually going to remove the ignition coil because it was a bit tight getting out and I don't want to be fiddling on when I've got gasket cement in place. So we need to uh, first of all fully take the bolt out of the end of the cam chain adjuster and the spring. Just take that out for now. Now you need to release the ratcheting mechanism just by pressing on it then you can push the, the operating rod back in. Now install this back in the motor. You notice it's slightly offset so it only goes in one way. Now you need to tighten both these bolts up to 10 newton meters and you need to pop the spring and the bolt back in the hole again there. As you do you can hear you're pushing the the operating rod forward against its ratchet mechanism. You should always be able to hear that little click click of the ratchet. And once you've got these tightened you then need to torque that. You see these are 10 newton meters and that is 8 newton meters. Even though it's a larger head it's only 8 newton meters. So I'll torque those up now. And for peace of mind once you've got the cam chain tensioner and you might just want to Take it right through a full cycle and check it again. It's no harm to keep checking that your cam timing is absolutely right. Just to keep you, you happy at the end of the day that you haven't done something wrong. So every time you turn it this way, but don't never turn it back because that'll throw you setting out because you're pushing against the cam chain adjuster. Always turn it anti-clockwise. Go through two full turns until you come back up to your T mark at the top here. And if you're checking your hole again, that should be spot on. It's always worth checking it again with a full tension on the cam chain. 
just to be sure there's nothing untoward. I've cleaned off all the old gasket from the head now. Now we're using the gasket cement that Royal Enfield recommends, which is Loctite Silicon 5900. Now the gasket cement that Royal Enfield uses is grey colour, and this is actually black, I couldn't get it in grey. Uh, maybe it's only made for Royal Enfield in, in grey, but uh, anyway, so what we need to do is put a very thin bead. Don't go crazy, because you don't want it ending up in the engine too much. Just apply a thin bead. Okay, so that's well, a fine bead of gasket cement applied all the way around there. And all we need to do now is carefully put the cam cover in place. Making sure it locates on its dowels. And then just give it a good push down. So now it's just a matter of popping all the bolts back in with the washers on, all in the right order and we'll talk it down in the correct sequence. So I've got all the bolts in there now and all pulled down and now I'm going to torque them down. Now Royal Enfield says a torque for these bolts is between 10 and 14 Newton meters and the small ones is between 8 and 12. So I'm going to torque everything down there to 10 Newton meters first and then I'll go around the larger ones and I'm going to take them up to 12. So that's it all torqued down there now. Now what we need to do is set the tappets. The, the tappet setting on this is 0.08mm on the inlet and 0 0.010 on the exhaust. Now the engine's in exactly the right position at top dead centre and compression to, to set the tappets so we don't have to do anything else. Let really just adjust them. So I've adjusted the tappets, just put the covers back on there now. What I'm going to do now, now I've got all the, the top end all built up and sealed. Before I put the spark plug in, I'm going to turn the engine over a, a few times just to pump a bit of oil up into the top end to get the cam all lubed. You can't really lube the cam the way this goes because you'll you'll get oil on the gasket surfaces. So the only real way you can do with this is turn it maybe it's half a dozen or ten times anti-clockwise. That will get plenty of oil up the top, don't worry, but never start a cam up dry because the first few seconds of a cam's life are its hardest. So I'm just going to whiz that over a few times. Now one thing you should look for before you, you, you finish off is you should see a fine bead of silicon all the way around the head and around every surface that you, you've done. Um, and that just shows there's just enough in there to squeeze out and seal the gasket. So I'll put these covers back on now, this one as well. I'm going to reinstate the coil, plug it back in, reinstate the um, air injection system valve, control valve, plug that back in. Uh, and then we're ready to pop the tank back on. So I've refitted the coil, the air injection valve, connect the wiring back on that. Fitted the tank back on making sure I connected the sender wire on the other side and the vent pipe for the top of the tank underneath. It's a bit of a swine to get the tank on because of the brake lines. It might be easier if you pull them up a little bit to get them in. Now, don't forget when you put your rear mountains on, there's two large washers sit underneath the mountains. It's a bit awkward to get them on and I don't know why they've done it like that. They could have just put a, a compact a complete rubber mountain but there's two big washers underneath there so don't forget them tighten them up so all we need to do now is reconnect the fuel pump hear a click as you go in now reconnect your fuel line you know, there's always a little bit of fuel around on the end of it when you push it on you should hear a good click it's very important that 
Now what I'm going to do is reconnect the battery, but before I start the bike up I'm going to turn the ignition on a few times to let the fuel system pressurise and I'm going to check it for leaks, particularly at this joint because I've had these uh, quick release joint seal, uh, seals failed before. So that's the battery back on. So just, just cycle it on and off a couple of times and you hear the fuel pump getting the pressure up there. And that should be enough. And if you've got a leak, you'll be able to feel it straight away. Now there's still a bit of fuel around there. From when I put it on, so I'm going to give it a wipe off and just do that again, just to make sure. Because it is really important in this plastic bowl on the bottom here is actually quite vulnerable to damage. Yeah, that's that's fine, there's no leak there now. Right, so moment of truth. Will it fire up first time? Go. Starts up, takes all up there, thank you. Go. Don't be tempted to rev a camshaft, an engine you've just fitted a camshaft into. Ideally just start up let it tick over a few times just to get make sure the oil is getting round there. The, the hardest time of the life for a camshaft are the first few moments it starts up. So just be gentle on it. Don't be tempted to rev it to the red line. And remember you must run it in. You must allow it to bed in. I would say minimum of 300 miles before you start revving it before, above 4,000 revs. Then just little short bursts, and then after about another 50 miles, you can you can ride it flat out all the time. So I need to get out on this now and do some miles on it, get it bedded in, and then we'll get it on the dyno, and we'll get to the next stage. So that's the cam all in there now. Uh, it's the first time you do it, it takes you a couple of hours because you're double checking everything. Uh, now I've done it a few times. It, it, it probably takes about an hour to do it. It, it isn't really a hard job. The video makes it look complicated because we we do things very deliberately and slow and show you how to do it and obviously that takes us a little bit more time as well. But if the first time you do it, I'll allow about an hour and a half and it should see you all done. The longest part of the job is just getting the gasket cement off the off the top cover uh, and it's worth investing in some silicon gasket remover spray. Um, one of the most important things now about when you start the bike up and run it is to be very gentle on the revs for at least 100 miles. That first 100 miles of life is critical for a camshaft. That's when all its wear will occur if you're not gentle with it. So what I say is not exceed 4,000 revs for the first 100 miles and then slowly build it up uh, to about 300 miles and then it's, it's fully run in. Never exceed 5,000 revs for the first 300 mile. Uh, and just in short bursts above 4,000. Um, and then once you've done 300 miles, it's good to go and you can use the full power that the, the motor has. Um, these cams have just completely transformed the whole character of the bike. It's, it seems to take it over a tipping point of a, a bike that I couldn't exactly gel with to a bike that I absolutely love now. Um, I use it all the time, even if it's just to go to, you know, down to the garage to pick some parts up or if I want to go off for a 300 mile journey uh, out of all the bikes because I've got it so comfortable and just set up nice now it, I, I really love it um, but I'm sure I'm, I'm preaching to a lot of you, you know, converted out there with the Himalayas I know a lot of people do love them um, but the, the feedback that we get is it's just that little bit underpowered you will find that it, the feedback I get actually I didn't really notice it myself is but every cam that we've put in Everybody says that it seems to have a, a much smoother power delivery now, and the engine itself seems to run smoother. Um, it isn't a, a, a high performance modification. What it will do is it brings out the full potential of the motor, probably the way it was designed to be. And it just, like I say, that just those few, well, it's an extra 20% power. That little bit extra completely transforms the way the bike rides and feels, and I'm sure you'll love it. As with everything, we give a full money back on it guarantee. If, if you're not 100% happy with any product we make, simply send it back and we'll give you a full refund, including your postage. Uh, we can't say fairer than that. It comes with a year, a one year manufacturer's uh, back warranty. Um, we've been using this manufacturer for seven years now. 
Uh, they're one of the oldest camera makers in the UK and they're very, very reliable. Uh, we haven't had any issues with them whatsoever. Um, the instructions and the talk settings we will uh, show on uh, the instructions that we give with the cam. Uh, and there's also a link where it'll take you to the, the Euro 4 workshop manual, which is the only one that's available at the moment. But the cam fitting is the same for all the models, whether it be Carburetta, Euro 4, Euro 5. Um, there hasn't been that many changes on the Euro 5 model, but it was worth checking it out because there is some subtle little changes to the rate fuels. Um, but on, on none of the fuel injection models do you need to make any changes. The ECU adapts, we've checked all the fuel ratios and everything's fine. So, thanks for watching. These are available now on the web shop. Um, and thank you. Bye now.